the Joe Rogan experience. I was a video game developer uh, in Silicon Valley, and then I became an investor in the video game industry. My background's in computer science. And uh, what happened was after I sold my last video game company uh, back in 2016, so we're talking like, you know, seven years ago now, uh, eight years ago now, and I put on a virtual reality headset and started playing a VR ping pong game. Right now, these headsets were even bigger than they are now, and they were wired. So there's no mistaking you're in virtual reality. But what happened was that the the, the ping pong game was so realistic that for a moment my brain forgot that this wasn't a real game of table tennis. So much so that I tried to put the paddle down on the table, and I tried to lean against the table. But of course, there was no table, <laughs> so the controller fell to the floor, and I almost fell over. I had to do one of these double takes, like, oh, wait. I'm just in VR, right? So I started to think about how long would it take us to build something like the Matrix, something that's uh, so immersive that you would forget right, that you were inside a video game. And so that led me to this idea of the simulation point, which is a kind of technological singularity. But then I started to research things like quantum physics and some of the mysteries around you know, the observer effect and quantum mechanics. And, and then I started to look at all the world's religions, and I realized that they're all kind of saying the same thing, which is that there is no physical universe. Uh, and so, you know, that led me to the conclusion that we are most likely inside some kind of a computer simulation or a massively multiplayer video game, depending on how you look at it. But what, where did that computer game, where did that simulation come from if we are inside of it? Well, that, that's the big question, right? Uh, and there's two versions of simulation theory. And, you know, I teach a class on this at Arizona State University. It's probably the first college-level class about simulation theory, and it kind of pulls in science fiction, religion, philosophy, and technology. But one of the key distinctions I, I tell my students to make, because it's not talked about a lot with simulation theory, is what I call the NPC versus the RPG versions of simulation theory. Okay. Right? So NPC, mm. as you probably know, means you know, uh, non-player characters within video games. So those are the AIs in the video game, uh, you know, the bartenders, the people you're beating up, the opponents, all of that stuff. But basically, they're just code and they're AI. Then there's the RPG version, which is that we are actually doing a role-playing game, right? So you exist outside the game, and then you have a character or avatar inside the game. So it's just like what we would consider an MMORPG today, right? except with more sophisticated technology. And so in that case, uh, you, know, you get a little bit of a different answer than if you talk about an NPC-only type of simulation, right? because that's just running on a computer, and we're all AI in that case. Now, the two aren't mutually exclusive. right? In a, in a video game like Fortnite or whatever, World of Warcraft, you have... NPCs and you have PCs or player characters, right? So you've got both of those things going on. And so depending on how you look at it, you might come to different, uh, you know, different answers about who's outside the simulation, uh, at which would answer the question of who made the simulation, right? Yeah. So in the first case, uh, you basically say that if we can get to the point where we can build these simulations... Uh, what I call the simulation point. So I call that a kind of technological singularity. Now, we've heard the term singularity mostly because of, like, uh, AI and super intelligent AI, right? Uh, and, you know, AI is going to take over the world. But the guy who defined the term was actually a computer scientist who became a science fiction writer named Werner Vinge. In fact, he just passed away, like, a month ago or something. He was a real pioneer in, like, science fiction and the cyberpunk uh, kind of subgenre or so. And so he said the singularity happens when technology increases exponentially to the point where everything will be different for humans after that point. Now, he gave like four different ways we could reach the singularity. Most of us talk about only one, which is AI starts to become super intelligent and uh, it grows exponentially and, and everything will be different. But, but I think this, this idea of the simulation point where we can create simulations that are indistinguishable from reality – and I lay out like 10 stages in my book of all the technology we would need, including brain-computer interfaces like uh, in the Matrix, right? So this, or Neuralink. Or Neuralink, right. We're getting there, right? We're, yeah, we're very close. We're, we're at the beginning of that whole yeah. thing. And so that's stage eight, stage seven and stage eight on the way to the simulation point. Um, and, you know, being able to read, but also then being able to write memories as well. And then have – so the definition of the simulation point is being able to create – 
a virtual reality that is indistinguishable from physical reality with AI characters that are indistinguishable from biological characters. So, you know, you wouldn't be able to tell you're talking to an NPC, basically. Right. We're getting closer to that already, right? Yes. Yeah, I mean, there's, like, companies out there doing smart NPCs now inside uh, video games. Uh, right, but what would be the difference between looking at what is possible in the future and making either a hypothesis or suggesting that that has already taken place? Right. So that's kind of the leap, right, that you need right. to make, which is to say that if we can do it, now let's imagine a civilization that was a million years ahead of us, a thousand years ahead of us, yeah, uh, even 200 years ahead right. of us, right? But certainly a thousand years ahead of us. So where will computers be in a thousand years? They would already have created these types of simulations, right? Because right? if we can do it, now, 50 years ago, we didn't know if we could do it. We didn't know if computers could get to that point, mm -hmm. right? Today, we're pretty sure we can get there. In fact, I'd say that I'm 70% sure that we will get to the simulation point, which means I think there's a 70% chance we're living inside a simulation. Um, and so the point is, if they already got there, they created a whole bunch of simulations, okay? And you can't tell the difference whether you're in the real world or a simulated world, right? So there's 99 of these, there's one of these, but you can't tell the difference. So which one are you more likely in? Just statistically speaking now, we're not even you know, projecting the technology forward. We're just saying it's more likely you're in one of the 99 than the one because there's so many more of these, right? Sort of. If you can't tell the difference, right? If you can't tell the difference. But <sighs> there's so many things you have to think about, right? There's so many things you have to take into consideration. One of them is we don't have a straight linear line from the moment that we're born to the moment that we exist in currently. The reason being is that we go to sleep every night. Right. It's a weird thing. We shut off every night. Yep. And we wake up intermittently, and you go back to bed, maybe you have to pee, maybe you're thirsty, you go back to bed, and then you wake up again. But when you wake up, you are just waking up. Like when I woke up this morning, I don't know if this is the life I've always lived, Right. I'm assuming it is because I have all these detailed memories of the past. I see my dog. He exact. He reacts the exact same way he always does. You know, I see my wife. I see my kids. I see my house. It's the same house that I remember. But I'm not sure. I just woke up. Right. I'm a little it, foggy already. It just right? exists in your memory. At it that just point. exists in your right. memory. And so this might be the first day of my life. Right. If suppose that you can implant false memories, right? Right. So, so this was a popular topic for Philip K. Dick, right? Yes. In movies like Total Recall, mm -hmm. and even in Blade Runner. Right? Mm -hmm. You know, I interviewed his wife while I was researching, you know, my book. He and was a wild boy. He was an interesting guy, right? Yeah. He, and, and he said some interesting things. In fact, all the way back in 1977 in Metz, France, at a sci-fi convention, he said, there's a pretty famous quote. He said, uh, we are living in a computer programmed reality. And the only clue we have to it is if some variable is changed, some alteration occurs in our reality, right? And that's become kind of a famous quote in the simulation world. Mm. But if you listen to the rest of the quote, he says, well, we would basically rerun the same events and we would change some variables, right? And we would have a sense of deja vu, like maybe we've already done this, right? Maybe I've, you know, talked to you before right. in a different run of the simulation, mm -hmm. right? And, and this idea... Like after I wrote my first book on this topic, the simulation hypothesis, uh, this, this idea wouldn't leave me that, well, if you can run one simulation, you can certainly run it multiple times. In mm -hmm. fact, that's what we would do. Right? If we were running a simulation of the weather, we wouldn't just run it once. We would run it multiple times. And if we were doing a simulation of whatever, right, pandemic, anything, name it, we would change the variables and we would go forward. And so, you know, when I interviewed Tessa, you know, uh, Phil K. Dick's last wife, she said um, that he came to believe this was really happening, right? That someone was altering with our reality and they would change a few variables and rerun the simulation forward. Uh, so now we're getting pretty deep in the rabbit hole. So this is the mm. topic of my second book, which is called The Simulated Multiverse. This idea that each of these timelines uh, could be like a different run of the simulation itself. Hmm. So... 
So that gets a little weird at that point, right? Because now we're saying that time isn't the same thing, right, that we think it is. So with the simulation hypothesis, we're saying that space doesn't really exist. Uh, it basically gets rendered for us like a video game. And then with this second idea, we're saying that time doesn't really exist because what you remember could have been either implanted memories or it could be a specific run of the simulation, right? So if you run it again, maybe things are slightly different the second time you run it. Um, like, So Philip K. Dick came to believe that his novel, The Man in the High Castle, which was turned into a pretty cool series. I don't know if you've, uh, if no. you've seen it. It was on uh, Amazon uh, a few years ago. But in, that, uh, in the novel and in the series, Germany and Japan won World War II. Uh, and so you see in America that's been divided. Like the East Coast is uh, run by the Germans, the West Coast is run by the Japanese, and you see this kind of fascist type, type world. And so you know he later came to believe that this actually happened and somehow the simulators re-ran it again, and the current timeline is one that was allowed to go forward, like you know, further forward than where that one might have ended. And so he says that at some point, all these memories came flooding back to him of this other timeline. Um, he called it, uh, he used this Greek word, it's called an anamnesis, which means a loss of forgetfulness, right? So he said, we might be able to remember these other runs of the simulation. Uh, so anyway, that gets us into, you know, this whole idea of is the past what we think it is, right? That's, I think, the question you were asking, right? Because yeah. <laughs> you're like, if I just remember uh, X, Y, Z, is that what actually happened? Or is it just uh, a representation of the past in the present? Yeah. And so when I started looking into the quantum physics side of it, I found something really weird uh, and we'll talk, we can talk about the observer effect, but this was like even weirder than that. And it, it was something proposed by John Wheeler, who uh, was um, at Princeton with Einstein. And, you know, he was a bit younger than, you know, Niels Bohr and Einstein and all these kind of uh, forefathers of quantum mechanics. And he came up with uh, several things that I was talking about. But one of them is the delayed choice experiment or, or the cosmic delayed choice experiment, which puts into doubt this idea of the past. And since we're talking about the past, let, let's go into this now, uh, if you don't mind. Okay. So imagine there's a, a, a something like a quasar, and that's a billion light years away from us, right? And the light is coming from that quasar to here, so it's going to take a billion years to get here because it's a billion light years away. Uh, and then suppose there's something in the middle, like a black hole uh, that's in the middle, or, or a galaxy, something that's very gravitationally big. And so suppose the light has to go to the left or to the right of that object. And suppose that object is like a million light years away from us. So it's a lot closer, but it's still a million light years away. So the decision about when the light goes to the left or to the right would have to be made when. Right? It would have to be made in the past about a million years ago because it takes light from that, let's say it's a black hole. It's a million light years away, so it takes a million years for the light to reach Earth. And we can measure whether it went to the left or to the right. Um, well, it turns out that decision is in the past, as we think of it, but what the delayed choice experiment tells us is that that decision is made now when we measure that light. Right? When the little telescopes, suppose we have two telescopes, one picks up on the left, one picks up on the right, and it's when we do the measurement and until we do that measurement, both of those possibilities still exist. So we have these two possible pasts. A million years ago, right, the light went to the left or to the right. But which one happened isn't decided until the measurement is done today. Uh, 